my bombardious friends, chapter 5 of Make Your Mark just came out, and it was just about what I think everyone expected. That's it. Thank you so much for watching. Have a good night. Now, for those of you who are interested in the details, Chapter 5 was a small step up from Chapter 4 in multiple ways, but it also had several really bad parts that dragged it down quite a bit. And just so you know, this is a spoiler review, and I am a reviewer that, when I see a problem with the writing in a show, I'm gonna grump about it, dissect it, and probably rant about it. If you don't like negative reviews, I won't blame you for turning back now. This just isn't a review for you. You have been warned, and without further ado... Episode 1, Cutie Blossom Bash. This episode is all about the aftermath of Missy getting her cutie mark, and for some reason, similar to how they did away with heart swarming, they also did away with cute senoras, and now instead have an event called a Cutie Blossom Bash, where a bunch of ponies get together to celebrate their cutie marks and apparently dine with royalty? In this episode, we finally get some explanation as to how cutie marks work in G5. Apparently, a pony earns their cutie mark when the, and I quote, magic of their personality and luminescence shine. Okay, so it's not tied to special talent or destiny at all anymore? Sure, why not throw out more of the world building from G4? Anyway, Missy makes a comment about how she is going to be the oldest pony there, and how, because of Opaline, she wasn't able to shine until now and is very clearly nervous about the whole event. Keep this line from Misty in mind for later. We also learn how the main five got their cutie marks, and oh boy, get ready for some stuff to not make sense. First off, I'm still questioning how ponies got their cutie marks in the first place in a world without magic. The first cutie mark we learn about is Sunny's, which she got from selling lemonade, and two ponies wanted the last one. Apparently, these grown ponies fought over it, and Sunny's solution was to split the lemonade. Then she got her cutie mark in being able to help ponies put their differences aside. Um, question? How the heck does a shooting star represent putting aside differences? And what differences is she talking about? The only thing we know about these two ponies is that they both like lemonade, and that's not a difference. That's a similarity. That's what they have in common. Shouldn't her cutie mark be more representative of sharing or compromise? Or maybe it could just be one of Starlight's equal signs. Then we learn about Zip getting her cutie mark in... Athletics? I think she got it from bouncing off the walls in such a way that it looked like she was flying. So in a weird way, she kind of got her cutie mark from deceiving other ponies. This is fine. After Zip got her cutie mark, Pip got hers in singing after being inspired by her sister's performance. We then learn that Hitch got his cutie mark from, get this, being kind. What? You thought this whole time that that sheriff badge represented his destiny of being a sheriff and that his special talent was upholding law and order? Nope! Somehow, that badge represents kindness. They are really trying their hardest to make him more like Fluttershy. Yellow horse who talks to animals and is all about kindness? <sighs> also, had he never happily shown any pony kindness before this? How has he not earned his cutie mark sooner? Because we learned that cutie marks no longer appear upon realizing who you are, but rather they appear upon your first time exemplifying who you are. Anyway, then there's Izzy's mark, which she got from unicycling. This one makes sense. I don't think anybody's surprised by this one. But then we learn about another pony's cutie mark, and it is seashell. What does it represent? That she is as unique as every seashell on the beach. You heard that right. Her personality trait or special talent or whatever it is that makes her special is being unique. Every pony is unique. What are you talking about? Cutie marks are supposed to be one of the things about a pony that makes them unique. Ironically, a cutie mark that is about being unique is the least unique cutie mark to ever exist. Honestly, could the writers have gotten any more lazy with this idea? Oh, and by the way, if you go to the beach, it is not hard to find near identical seashells. Even more ironically, seashells are not that unique either. Anyway, so you know how Misty was going to be the oldest pony there and how she was nervous about the whole event? Well, it turns out that she was not nervous about the one thing that they alluded to her being nervous about, but rather she was nervous because she is... shy. That is... so much less compelling than what I thought the reason was. The problem is not that she thinks ponies will mock her for being too old or anything. She's just... shy. You had a perfectly good setup for the story. Well, why throw it away? Also, cutie marks can grow plants now, so earth pony magic is suddenly looking a lot less cool. Misty then suddenly realizes what her cutie mark represents, and it represents that she is able to change her... destiny. I have... 
too many questions that stem from this and questions about how destiny works in this show anymore. But I have already spent way too long ranting about cutie marks and that's not even the worst part of the episode. Speaking of the worst part of the episode, Misty has a confession for the group about Opaline. She tells them, and hold on to your seats because this is gonna shock you, that Opaline is not defeated. And they are all shocked by this. And when I first heard this, I genuinely laughed because how the heck did they not know that? Opaline's last words to them were, you can't keep me here forever. And Sunny agreed with her on that saying, no, but I can keep you away from my friends. These characters are so hilariously dumb that this scene actually made me laugh because it was just that bad. Also, if they didn't know about Opaline, then why is Misty only just now informing them? At this point, they should be seriously questioning her loyalty. I know I am! Also, it turns out that the reason Opaline can't enter Equestria is because of Twilight's Invisible Bubble that was mentioned in an earlier episode. So, Misty then goes back to live with Opaline to act as a double agent and let the characters know whatever she is up to. Episode over, thank goodness! Episode 2, Family Trees Part 1 Misty has a vision about a tree with a door and a shadowy figure in Bridalwood. Believing that this may somehow be tied to Opaline, the group then go to Bridalwood to investigate, as well as try to find a cure for Sparky who has not been feeling well ever since Opaline drained him of his magic. Misty then gets more visions along the way and realizes that these are not visions of the future, but rather memories. Then by following these memories, they come to the wishing tree, which because magic happened, it suddenly starts glowing and a bunch of breezes fly from it. They have trouble communicating though because their language is apparently a sped up version of the pony's language. Why? If they are having so much trouble understanding them, all the breezes need to do is talk slower. It's not that hard to do! But no, they just record and slow down their audio instead. Honestly, at this point, why don't they just use cutie marks to magically make them able to communicate? I don't see why not, given that cutie marks can do literally anything the plot demands. The Breezies then lead them and some other ponies in Bridalwood to a portal that leads to the Breezy World, which seems to largely consist of a bunch of shops, many of which are selling items from Ancient Equestria. One of them gives Misty an enchanted key to a door that will take her to the place she most wants to go. But it is one use only. She then magically disappears for some reason, and every pony scrambles to find her. Episode ends. A couple more positive things I want to say about this episode. I really appreciate that they are finally addressing Pip's phone problem. Because in this episode, she is actually trying to live in the moment rather than just take pictures and videos of everything she sees and post selfies. I would have preferred this arc get its own episode and have a lot more thought put into it. Maybe she's in denial about her problem and her friends need to talk some sense into her. Eh, whatever. I'll take what I can get. Then there's Sunny, who seems to be at her best in this episode, and that actually carries through into multiple episodes in this chapter. We're constantly told about how much she cares about other ponies, but we are never really shown that through her actions. Honestly, many of the actions we see from her that are portrayed as caring about others seem far more like she just wants to help herself. Such as the whole community garden thing, where it really seemed like she just wanted a garden for herself. No one else really cared, and I don't really blame them since this community garden garden is outside of town and right by Sunny's home, but she wanted to put every pony to work anyway. Here, however, Zip is constantly pressuring Misty to remember her past, and Sunny has to tell her to back off a little and is trying to comfort Misty and give her some space. This may seem like a small, insignificant thing, but these small character moments are part of what make characters feel more real, have more interesting dynamics, and can make them more likable. Anyway, Episode 3, Family Trees Part 2. While the group is looking for Misty, they find a fossil of a dragon print. This print then causes Sparky to glow and to regain some of his energy. So they realize that to cure Sparky, they need to go and get him around some more dragon things. And so they decide to search for his family. Misty, who, if you remember, just teleported to a random location, is then led back to the group by a Breezy. The fact that she finds her way right back makes me question as to why they had her disappear in the first place. And the reason seems to sadly be just so that the episode could have a really cheap cliffhanger. No explanation as to what caused her to teleport other than magic happened! Zip then searches for the door the key goes to in the woods and immediately finds it. What was her explanation as to how she found it so easily? Well, you see, you can't see the door from the ground because it's so overgrown, but when you look from the sky, it's visible. What the heck? This is stupid! Looking from 
from the sky shouldn't help you see it. In fact, it should make it harder to see. If it's overgrown, a closer look is what's going to find it. Literally, all they needed to do to solve this was say, the door was built many years ago, and ever since then, the tree has grown, causing the door to move upwards into the air where it got overgrown by vines, and that's why Zip was able to spot the door from above. They then used Earth Pony Magic to shrink the tree and lower the door to the ground where they can all walk into it. Boom! Easy fix! Anyway, Misty originally wanted to use the key to find her family, but instead, she decides to use it to help find Sparky's family. So the place she most wants to go is the Dragonlands. They enter the door, bringing them to the Dragonlands, which has a lot more plants than I remember. Being here causes Sparky to regain his fire breath. The characters look around real quick, but they don't see any other dragons around. So they assume they all left, most likely sensing Opaline's power and running away so that she can't steal their magic. So they all immediately give up and head back to the portal, where Pip shows every pony some pictures of herself, Zip, Haven, and Alphabittle. Misty then recognizes Alphabittle as her father? Yeah, this is actually something that the episode has been hinting at the entire time. And that shadowy figure in her visions? Yeah, that was Alphabittle. Anyway, they go to the Crystal Tea Room to meet Alphabittle and reunite these two in what is actually a touching moment. Best part of the episode by far and quite possibly the entire chapter. Overall, I think this episode was pretty rough, but it is lifted up somewhat by the ending. This episode had quite a mix of good and bad moments. Episode 4, Father of the Bridalwood. This episode has two stories in it. One focuses on Misty and Alphabittle's relationship. He is constantly wanting to do things with Misty that he did with her as a filly, but Misty is not a fan of any of it anymore because she is not the same pony he was when he lost her. Eventually, though, Alphabittle realizes that she's not having a good time and that she's not the same pony she used to be. And so they instead do what she wants to do, which is just to make some tea for her dad. This half of the episode, I would say, is well done. The second half of the episode is not bad either. But despite that, there's one little thing that is mentioned that brings down the quality of the entire series. And it is one of my biggest criticisms of the show dating way back to one of the earliest videos I ever made before the movie even released. The point that I made a long time ago was that whatever G5 does to have Equestria become divided, Equestria cannot fall under Twilight's rule, as it would undo everything she and her friends built. That has since been confirmed to have happened, but now the situation is even worse! There has been a lot of ambiguity as to how much time has passed since the events of the last problem, and many people have thought, well, maybe there was at least a few centuries or even a millennia of peace before Equestria fell. This way, they weren't completely undermining everything Twilight built. But nope! Turns out Equestria has only been divided for such a short amount of time that this character named Elderflower actually remembers Equestria before it was divided! It also turns out that her great-great-great aunt, which is not that many generations, was Moon Dancer. So yeah, peace barely lasted any time at all. Way to undermine literally everything the series has spent nine seasons building up to. Anyway, Elderflower tells the ponies that the tree they grew is a magical tree called a together tree. And it can only be created when ponies come together in true friendship. The wishing tree and the tree they grew in Maritime Bay in chapter two are together trees and they are all connected by their roots. She also describes them as great protectors. So yeah, this episode was good over Overall, it just had this one little detail that infuriates me. This was a good episode. I enjoyed it. Misty making tea for her dad? Come on, that's just sweet. Good overall, just one really, really bad implication. Episode 5, Main Smelody. In this episode, Pip finds a flower that can shine her hooves extremely well, but it comes with a terrible smell. Pip, however, gets used to the smell and starts selling hoof cures using nail polish made from this flower. However, the terrible smell causes it to trend online, where every pony is stopping by Main Melody to try the Main Smelody Challenge, where they all go to get a hoof cure and try not to gag. Pip is completely unaware of this, and Jazz is trying to hide this fact from her as best she can because she doesn't want Pip to know that she is the butt of a joke. Tell her the truth! Eventually, though, Izzy convinces Jazz to tell Pip what's been going on, and Pip takes it very well. Izzy then gives Pip a new flower to add to the polish that eliminates the bad odor. I think this episode was handled fine. It's not particularly strong in any area. It's not particularly weak. It just really didn't have that much to make it very interesting. It was just fine. There's also a side plot where Zip and Sunny are looking for information on the past and alicorns, and they find a map in a box of Argyle's old stuff, which I'm glad they are finally addressing that those artifacts exist. They have not done anything to even touch them since the movie. They then take the map they found to the Breezy, seeing 
seeing if any of them have any information on it, but no one does. One Breezy does, however, give Sunny a mysterious locket. This never comes up again, and it's probably an element that will have some significance in Chapter 6. Moving on to Episode 6, Nightmare on Main Street. This episode opens up with Hitch setting up a game for Nightmare Night, where the ponies of Maritime Bay search for a golden pumpkin. He hides it under the Together Tree with a bunch of other pumpkins, which all start teleporting to Opaline. She then realizes that the reason this is happening is because the Together Tree is linked to her own Together Tree that grows throughout her castle, and she states that she grew it, which makes me question what friends she could have possibly had that allowed her of all ponies to grow it. Anyway, she uses this tree as a method of breaking through the invisible bubble that Twilight set up. And so she enters Maritime Bay. This is it, folks! The almighty villain has found a way past the one thing keeping her out! She is now unstoppable! All these ponies around, it's so easy for her to drain their magic, steal their cutie marks, and gain enough might to overpower even Sunny Star Scout! How exciting! How thrilling! How- Oh, hooves! That was so cool! Ah! Do the laugh again! Do the laugh again! Oh, not exactly the tone I was expecting, but okay. But still, she's gonna drain the magic of an entire town, right? <laughs> ah, yes! Things are getting real! It's going to take me all night if I'm going to do this one by one! Oh, I see. Apparently, she can only do one cutie mark at a time and needs to bring each cutie mark back to the lair. You know, she started off as this super threatening villain that we were told had the ability to drain all magic from Equestria. But the more we learn about her, the more steps draining magic apparently takes to the point where she's not very threatening. T-Rex was a serious threat because he could drain any pony's magic in an instant and even drain the magic of an entire army when they got too close. But Opaline? She needs a stone to drain Dragonfire for her, which she then takes from the stone. And it's an incredibly lengthy process. So she's not very good at draining dragon magic despite being a fire alicorn. She can't drain the magic from the crystals because that would potentially destroy all magic. She can only steal cutie marks from one pony at a time for some reason. How did Twilight lose to her again? There was also a party going on in the Bright House, but it's so inconsequential that it's not even worth discussing. Only thing worth noting is that Sparky breathed some fire on the map they found and it magically restored it to how it was years ago. And it turns out that this map leads them to the Dragonlands which are apparently now called the Isle of Scaly. Of course, Sparky's magic would be the solution because all this show clearly needs is more Deus Ex Magica. No pony ever did find that golden pumpkin, by the way. Now, that was the last episode of this chapter, but there are a few extra points that I would like to touch on that I couldn't cleanly fit anywhere else into the video. So here you go! I noticed that the voice acting in this chapter seems to have improved. Now, I never thought it was bad to begin with. I thought that the voice acting was good before, but now for some reason in this particular chapter, the voice acting is excellent. There's just so much more energy and personality in the tones of the characters' voices. I don't know if the actors are settling into their characters now, or if they got a new director, or what, but whatever it is, I like it. It could also be that they were just given better dialogue to work with in this chapter, and so they were able to perform better. It also looks like the animation has improved yet again. You can much more easily see all the textures in the fur on the characters and other objects that are around them. And I didn't really notice any animation errors in this chapter, but I did notice the occasional shortcuts. But they weren't as blatant as they were in other chapters. I think this chapter was the best overall, and I did get more enjoyment out of it than any of the other chapters. But if I'm being completely honest, I think the main reason for that might not necessarily be because it did more stuff right, but because it just didn't do as much wrong. Oh, and I uh, do have one more question about this chapter. Has any pony told Alphabetal that Misty is currently living with an evil alicorn queen bent on stealing all magic in Equestria? Because I'm pretty sure if he knew that, he would be freaking out! Oh, by the way, if you're wondering about that word that I used in the beginning of the video to describe you guys watching, Bombardius is a new word that I made up that means wonderfully eccentric person that is worthy of an ice cream cone and a french toast. It also means that pickles suck!